from the Landmark Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's the Playboy Comedy Roast for Tommy Chung. Starring Richard Belzer. Mac and Jamie. Jerry Seinfeld. Dick Shaw. Marsha Warfield. Snappy White. And starring your roast master, David Steinberg. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's guest of honor, Tommy Chong. members of the dais, thank you. It's a very exciting night. We are here to roast... <laughs> We're here to roast... Tommy <laughs> Chong. <laughs> and Tommy, of course, will be ready by the time his turn comes up. A very special night tonight uh, as a Playboy roast. We have an innovation tonight, and that is we have the first time a roast has ever been done with a woman on the dais, uh, Marsha Warfield. <clears throat> so normally we like to sort of let out and let loose, but because of the presence of a woman, we'll be a little bit contained more than usual tonight. Oh, what's that, Marcia? Fucking well. <laughs> oh. Yes, we better. The first obscenity goes to Marcia for the evening. Now, Cheech and Chong are uh, a, a very prolific comedy team. Uh, they do a lot of things. They do concerts. They do uh, comedy albums. They do so many movies, sometimes two movies a year, and I wanted to find out how do they do so much. And I found out a lot of energy, a lot of talent, and a total disregard for quality. <laughs> Cheech and Chong were a groundbreaking, and are a groundbreaking comedy team. I've never heard of you before. <laughs> no. <laughs> Usually in comedy teams, one guy plays straight, and one guy plays funny. Abbott was the straight man, Costello was funny. But Cheech and Chong broke all the rules. Neither one of them is funny. <laughs> the reason Cheech and Chong are so successful is uh, chemistry. They learned to make angel dust. <laughs> When you talk, however, about Tommy Chong, when you talk about Tommy Chong, you're talking about movies. You're talking about Up in Smoke, Nice Dreams, a movie called Still Smoking. Three of the worst movies ever made. Rex Reed, the esteemed critic from New York, once said, I'd rather fuck Judith Christ than sit through another Cheech and Chong movie. <laughs> and Tommy says, so would he. <laughs> now, Tommy is actually continuing in a great show business tradition. Gracie Allen, the Daffy Dame, Edwin, the perfect fool, and now Tommy Chong, the slow-witted putz. <laughs> Tommy, 
Tommy, Tommy is a generous man. He just got back from Africa where he did his bit to stamp out hunger. He was turning the Ethiopians on to Coke. <laughs> But enough about me. <laughs> we have a wonderful dais here tonight. Dais, if you're a Litvak. <laughs> and we start with, we're a slappy, slappy white. Slappy white, uh, slappy white's a great comedian. He's the only black comic whose career was hurt by integration. <laughs> Martin Luther King once met Slappy White and said, I have a nightmare. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you will see why we like to start with Slappy White. He is simply one of the best. Ladies and gentlemen, Slappy White. I might seem a little... Uh upset because before I come on, the producer told me, he said, Slap it, just, just do about eight to 10 minutes. I said, man, hell, a hook will give me more time than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I can understand why they don't want me to be on too long because, goddamn, Hugh Hefner don't scrape the bottom of the barrel for this roast. <laughs> Anyway, Happy New Year, Chong. Because this, this is their new year. Yeah. Look at him sitting there with them little old squinty eyes. <laughs> you know why his eyes got like that? Eating rice. <laughs> they eat so much rice, when they got to go over, they go. <laughs> and that's just minute rice. <laughs> Long grain job will ruin you. <laughs> and don't get no wild right. I knew right away when they called me about this road that it was a goddamn Chinaman. <laughs> By that short name, you know, Ching Chong Ching Chang Chung. You got those little short names, put them all together, Ching Chang Chung Chang Ching. Sound like Sammy Davis falling down step with all his jewelry on. <laughs> I don't know what it's coming to. First it was the Puerto Ricans, then the Mexicans, now these bastards. <laughs> now, the first time I met Chong, I never did like him. I met him in Hollywood, he and this Marsha Warfield <laughs> at a masquerade party. He had on an Afro wig and some dark makeup. He came as Uncle Ben. She had on a coat made of pubic hairs. <laughs> she came as a real cunt. <laughs> He's the only guy I know can blow smoke rings with pubic hairs around them. <laughs> If I had a kid that looked like Chong, I'd beat the shit out of that son. <laughs> he come telling me Confucius said that the Chinese invented the toilet seat. I said, yeah, but American had enough nerve to put a hole in it. <laughs> but I know you had a roast coming, Chong, because roast is like hemorrhoids. Every asshole gets one. <laughs> Standing backstage, you come telling me, well, Slappy, I want you on the roast because you know I got a warm spot inside for black people. At the time, he was peeing in his pants. <laughs> but, John, this is your first roast, and I'm glad that I was the first up to try to help you on your way, so I want to <laughs> thank you for having me here, and if uh, we do good tonight, you know, fuck you. <laughs> Very good. 
Slappy White, not only a great comedian, but to me, I will always, he will always be worthy of respect as the last person to get a blowjob from Mom's Maybelline. <laughs> The Bells. My good friend, Richard Belzer, we've worked together a lot. I've directed, we've written, we know each other well. Richard, for those of you who don't know, is a cult comedian. Unfortunately, the cult is the Rajneesh cult. <laughs> uh, the Bells, if you have never seen The Bells work, I guarantee you, you will remember him. He is funny and brilliant, and here he is, Richard Belzer. Yeah! Thank you, Rabbi. I want to thank the congregation. I want to thank the founders. What is this? This is good for a roast. This. What is this? Good. How are you, Tommy? Thank you, sir. I'm sure that's a sincere laugh. I've been so funny that you can't control yourself. You know, it's funny. I, when I told, uh, I told my friend that I was doing a a show, I feel like Jack Benny, a show for the, for the Playboy channel, he laughed. <laughs> he said, I read Nietzsche, I read Sartre, I read Plato, but the greatest philosophy I've ever read is the Playboy philosophy. You know the Playboy philosophy. Whacking off is okay if you read an article by Norman Mailer afterwards. <laughs> he said, yeah, now Playboy has their own channel, which means I guess you don't have to worry about getting the pages stuck together anymore. <laughs> And now they have, uh, you can buy Playboy cassettes, which I guess gives a whole new meaning to the term head cleaning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and I mean, this is my friend talking, this isn't me, this is my friend. Anyway, um, I had to calm my friend down, he was very upset, so I, I, you know, I said, I had to explain to him who was on the dais. I said, you know, Slappy White, Jerry Seinfeld, Marsha Warfield, David Steinberg, of course, Tommy, Dick Sean, Mac and Jamie. And then he came to his senses, my friend did. My friend came to his senses, he said, Bells. You're a no-talent guy. What are you doing on a dais with all that talent? Some of the greatest talent. What, what are you doing up there? What are you doing up there with a David Steinberg? Ladies and gentlemen, David Steinberg, a great talent, a man of many hats and many talents. A man from Canada, can't even do a fucking Canadian accent, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> David Steinberg, my friend said that. I didn't, because I worked with David. I would never say that about him. <laughs> David Steinberg, who supposedly has influenced every young comic in the business except himself, ladies and gentlemen, my friend, said, what am I doing up there with him? That guy. David Steinberg, a man who had to be told before the show who Tommy Chong was, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My friend wanted to know what I was doing up there with this man. And Jerry Seinfeld, ladies and gentlemen. Jerry Seinfeld, a young up-and-coming comic who makes more money than I do. Figure that one out, ladies and gentlemen. My friend said that he makes more money than you do, though. Jerry Seinfeld, a man who thinks Bob Newhart is controversial, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> what am I doing on the panel with a man like this, ladies and gentlemen? Mac and Jamie, ladies and gentlemen, my friend said, you know, you know, everybody says the same thing after they see Mac and Jamie. They say, who cut the cheese? You know what I mean, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> my friend said, what am I doing up here with a team? I'm a one single person. And uh, Marsha Warfield, ladies and gentlemen, she's a woman, she's black, I'm scared shit of her, I have no jokes about her, okay? Because I don't want to get my ass kicked, all right? Thank you. What am I doing up here? with a town, a beautiful woman, a town that I'm not gonna make any cracks about. Why am I here with her? I'm white, I'm a Jew, I'm skinny, she's black. Who knows why I'm here? Why am I working stereo? I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. I go back and forth with this. This is real important. And a Dick Sean, who was one of my personal idols, Dick Sean, a man who eats a banana, and people think it's fucking cosmic. You figure it out, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> really cosmic, my friend said that. I didn't say that, I love Dick. And Dick Sean, ladies and gentlemen, man, there's a one-man show because nobody will fucking work with him, okay? <laughs> but my friend said, what am I doing up here with a man like this, with Dick Sean, a talent, a genius, with white hair and everything? And all this great talent, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and jaywalkers, all this great talent gathered here today <laughs> to celebrate the talent of our fellow performer, the multi-talented, the versatile Tommy Chong, ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Chung, a man who is so versatile, so talented, that he can play a person stoned on acid or pot, ladies and gentlemen. He's so fucking talented. And I think not to know what I'm doing up here with this man. A man, 
the only performer who is legally brain dead, ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Chong. But I do know one thing, that is, in all the years of reading the Playboy philosophy and being a student of sex, as we all are because we're human, and we all want to get laid, whether we're men or women, Tommy once in a while likes to get laid too. But uh, maybe that's the absolute truth, I don't know, but uh, I'm just presuming. But, uh, but I, I want to, I think there should be an article about not just humans, but Playboy should cover other species in nature. And, and I want to nominate for the, the best piece of ass in nature. It has to be the praying mantis. <laughs> now bear me out on this, ladies and gentlemen, I'll explain to you why. It's in keeping with the Playboy philosophy. The reason the praying mantis is the greatest piece of ass in the world is because when praying mantises mate, when they have sex, first they meet, okay? They meet, I don't know, they have a dating service, a little video, I don't know how they do it. They meet, they see each other, and they do a little kung fu dance. They do like a bad David Carradine impression, and they start mating. They start mucking, as we say, or mucking away. They start fucking. And while they're mating, the female starts eating the male's head, okay? Now, let me clarify this. She's not giving him head, ladies and gentlemen. She's eating his head, okay? She literally eats his head. First thing she does is bite his thorax, which releases all his sexual inhibition, and he starts fucking faster. He figures, I'm going to die. Let me get as much pussy as I can. So he starts fucking like crazy. The male, the male, Frank Mass. And the female eats his whole body. She eats his head, his neck, his throat, his stomach, his everything, his legs. The last thing that's left is this membrane encasing his genitals. She eats that, and there's just this dick in space left going, fucking, she eats that. He disappeared, she's pregnant. Now that's a great piece of ass, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't exist after you got laid, you know you've had some serious pussy, you know what I'm saying? That's why there's no praying man of singles bars, because you can't go in and brag you got laid, you wouldn't fucking be there, you know what I'm saying? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Tommy Chong. My friend wants to know what I'm doing here. The Bells, ladies and gentlemen, from Kierkegaard to a dick floating in space, an incredible range. <laughs> and now we come to Marsha Warfield, this uh, record-breaking moment. Marsha is, uh, has been making audiences laugh in every branch of our business lately, in TV films, in concerts, in nightclubs. Especially outstanding have been her appearances with uh, Richard Pryor. She's really up and coming and she's quite sensational. I, of course, uh, remember her as the person who broke Gary Coleman's cherry, but that's another story. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, please, Marsha Warfield. Thank you. I'm especially thrilled to be here. My agent uh, told me that I was going to come here and do a roast for Tommy Chong. Naturally, I said, who the fuck is Tommy Chong? <laughs> and I tried to remember. Tommy Chong. Tommy Chong. Did I fuck him? <laughs> And I couldn't remember. <laughs> so I probably did. <laughs> I kept thinking, I remembered, I, I think I remember, he's one of these guys that likes to make love in the morning. How many women like to make love in the morning? How many like to be awake when it happens? <laughs> this is important. <laughs> better than somebody poking you in the butt at 6 a.m. Right. And they all make that same stupid noise, you know. <laughs> Go back to sleep. <laughs> Better yet, go pee. <laughs> anyway, when I asked my agent who the fuck was Tommy Jones, 
He said he'd do some research and get back to me. <laughs> so when he called, he told me he was a guy who rolled those joints for Cheech in the movie. <laughs> so now we get to the important question. Where the fuck is Cheech? <laughs> Would you go to a concert and see Hall? <laughs> you want your oats, don't you? Where the fuck is Cheech? I guess he's getting back at him. Cheech did that video. <laughs> of course, Tommy sat at home going, fuck him. <laughs> Let him go to East LA. I'm going to Vegas, do a fucking roll. It's great to be here. It's great to be anywhere where you make this much money. <laughs> because, of course, you know, women love money. We will do anything for money. In fact, you can do anything to a woman for money. <laughs> Even shit you'd go to jail for if you didn't pay. <laughs> which accounts for why I'm here. <laughs> I also asked my agent, were there gonna be any black people here? He asked me, did Slappy White count? <laughs> We're still not sure. I like black people. <laughs> they told me, Tommy had a black kid. I said, what the fuck you do, adopt Webster? <laughs> Tommy's known for smoking a lot of pot. But you have to be careful when you smoke marijuana. It does strange things to you. I find when you smoke marijuana, everything becomes work. <laughs> <laughs> You find yourself saying things like, I don't mind changing the channel. <laughs> but like, then I'd have to get up. <laughs> Walk to the TV. I'm not into that right now. I like Captain Kangaroo. That's when you know you're too high if you're watching Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> Because for one thing, it don't come on no more. <laughs> and if you taped it, you've been fucked up far too long, okay? <laughs> this is a terrible fucking show. Piece of shit, okay, Captain Kangaroo? I mean, what was he before he was Captain Kangaroo? Lieutenant Kangaroo? <laughs> Anyway, this has been fun to be up here. I don't know why I was here. I just know I've had a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Marsha Warfield. We know why you're here, Marsha. We hope you come back to do a lot more of these. Mac and Jamie are here with us tonight. Mac and Jamie, you all know from their hit show, they have a syndicated comedy show that was just picked up for two years more, 80 shows, is that right? Oh, yeah. Just picked up today, as a matter of fact. Yeah. For those of you who have never seen Mac and Jamie before, they recently lost a laugh off to Siegfried and Roy. <laughs> And Jamie, you know, you're looking at them. A lot of people want to know which one is Mac, which one is Jamie, Jamie, Mac. Who gives a shit? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mac and Jamie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so We'd much. We'd like to first thank the uh, beautiful Landmark Hotel and Casino for taking such good care of us. Uh, oh, they've been great. Yeah, yeah. they really have. I, uh, my uh, room is overlooking the duck pond, as yeah. a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, and it, 
By the way, did you catch the excitement this afternoon? No. Uh, excitement? Apparently there was a terrible scene. I saw cop cars all over the place. Apparently there was some guy chasing the ducks, catching them with his bare hands, and eating them alive. <laughs> <laughs>
see you. It's nice to see you. Looking <laughs> spiffy tonight. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, wait a second. You're not uh, Cheech Marin, are you? No shit. <laughs> <laughs> very perceptive you are. <laughs> well, uh, who are you? My name is Raymond J. Johnson, Jr. Now, uh, you can call me Ray, or you can call me Jay, or you can call me Johnny, or you can call me Sonny, or you can call me Jenny, or you can call me Ray J, or you can call me RJ, or you can call me RJJ, or you can call me RJJ Jr., or you can call me Cheech, or you can call me Chong, or you can call me Chong, or you can call me Cheech. And if you get some fucked up, you can call me one of each. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you is. Whoever you is, you are. Yes. It's obvious that you're not Cheech of Cheech and Shaw. No, I Cheech of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> Look, we're in the middle of a rose. Would you please uh, tell us what you're doing here? What is I doing here? Yes, yes. What is I doing here? Well, actually, the real reason I is here yes. is to talk about something that is very important to many Americans. Arms control. Bladder control. Hmm. Could you tell me where the men's room is? Yeah, Bill Saluga, ladies and gentlemen. Bill Saluga. Jerry Seinfeld was a man who uh, did the Carson show 14 times last year, three times more than Carson. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, you're going to love him. He's terrific. He's been, uh, he's been on the Letterman show. He's got a lot of momentum. He is very funny. I have had to follow him before. Would you welcome, please, Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, God. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very nice to be here at uh, the Landmark, which is a nice hotel. And a casino, you're all here, you're gambling. Uh, the, the amazing thing to me about uh, casino hotels is how they manage to locate everything in the hotel across the casino. Have you found that? You go out there, where's the elevator? It's across the casino. Where's the coffee shop? It's across the casino. Every trip is 12 bucks and quarters there at the slot machines. <laughs> Half the people are out there trying to find the bathroom. That's why they have those little buckets in case they don't make it. <laughs> now this guy, now I've seen, now I saw you, the first time I ever saw uh, the comedy, half of a comedy team. This is the first time I've ever seen half a comedy team, as a matter of fact. Was, uh, I went to uh, college, upstate New York, and you were there and you were doing a routine about two dogs. It was a great routine where they would like, take a dump and they would talk to each other and I thought, anyone can do better than that, I thought. <laughs> that was my thought. But uh, Cheech and Chong, I don't know. I, you know what I like about their movies? The suspense, the... I mean, you never know. Will there be car trouble? Will there be a Mexican accident? You never really know until sometime six or seven minutes into it what's really gonna happen. And then, of course, it's pretty much... I like the movies. Uh, I've seen the movies, I've seen them, uh, well, they don't play at the specially selected theaters, they play more at the theaters near you. <laughs> you know those theaters, the one where your feet stick to the floor and you can't get out of it. But uh, I'm getting pretty tired of getting ripped off on the candy in the movie theaters, it just keeps getting, you know you're going to get ripped off when they have it in that glass case, it's a jewelry case <laughs> that they use for candy. I go up to the guy and say, I'd like to see something in a milk dud, if I could, something <laughs> elegant, you know. And, uh, Put it on that little black velvet display and you can really examine it. And... Who needs that horse bucket size of popcorn? That's, I can't believe, I don't need that much roofing insulation. People buy them, they come with ear hooks, you can wear it like a feed bag. And... It's gotta be the people sitting down front because they're watching these faces 40 feet tall, they lose their whole sense of perspective. Come out to the candy counter, get a popcorn that big and think, it's about right. 
rolling jujubes down there? Movies, yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, I'm on television, that's why I'm here. <laughs> People do want to be on television. Those shows, uh, you know, That's Incredible, or... That's the worst show. I don't even know if it's on. That show should have been called Stop Doing That. <laughs> Who do you think? Just cut it out. You're an adult. Don't stand on your head that long. <laughs> They'll put anybody on. This man is the proof of it. They had... They have a guy, they had a guy, my favorite guy I ever saw on, on That's Incredible was that guy that caught the bullet in his teeth. Anyone ever see that guy? They shoot, this is a real, I'm not making this up, they shoot a gun at this guy, he catches the bullet in his teeth. How do you learn to do this? How do you warm up? They fire a couple of raisinets at you and you feel like you're ready or something? He'll have a roast after this one, probably. Can't remember the man's name. This is the worst part about it. The man caught a bullet in his teeth. The name slips my mind. Think of that. If he knew this, wouldn't he feel like, what the hell do I have to do to really impress people? <laughs> Catch a cannonball in my eye? I don't... <laughs> I know if you're a burglar, this is a house you don't want to break into. You don't want to surprise this guy in the middle of the night. Shoot him in the bedroom. He comes walking out. <laughs> Think you got the wrong house, pal. <laughs> But that's, of course, just a joke. I'm happy to be here in a tuxedo. These are all rented clothes. That's kind of a rented fashion show. It's nice to have my own tuxedo. It's, if you've ever rented a tuxedo, there's nothing quite like the feeling of wearing clothes that have already been worn by 80 different high school kids on the most exciting night their glands have ever dreamed of. <laughs> you know, go to put your hands in the pockets. I'll think I'll just leave them outside. You know, how do you get married in rented shoes? How do you make a commitment for a lifetime your shoes have to be back by 5.30? <laughs> it's like going bowling when you rent shoes. I don't think I'd want to be up at the altar with a big eight and a half on the back of my heel. <laughs> if you know what I mean, and I think that you do. One of my favorite people, and I always talk about this guy because uh, he's my favorite guy. I always see him in the Guinness Book of World Records, the fattest man in the world. Have you ever seen this man? It's an unbelievable fact about this guy. Bob Hughes. 1,400 pounds. That is the real weight. The man is, he's let himself go, don't you think? <laughs> Come on, Bob, have a salad, do something. <laughs> Can't this guy get a small cone once in a while? You have to get the double banana boat barge every time. Skip the sprinkles, Bob, you're the fattest man in the world. I used to not even want to talk about him. I didn't want to offend somebody that has a weight problem. What kind of weight problem Am I even thinking of? You could weigh a thousand, it wouldn't make any difference. You could still go, well, he's not talking about me. This is a man with a serious weight problem. But I hope Bob gets it together. I hope he goes on a diet, drops a couple of hundred pounds. I don't know if 200 pounds even makes a dent on this guy. I mean, think of it. You're a friend of his, he loses 200 pounds. What are you gonna say to him? Hey, you look great, Bob. <laughs> what are you down to, 1,200 now? <laughs> you are a rail, baby. Are those new bib overalls? <laughs> What's he gonna say? And you know, I feel terrific. <laughs> Thank you very much. Joe <laughs> Seinfeld. Well, you've seen some of the best that there is, and at this point, the last person to perform before we introduce the roastee, you have to get someone who can clean up and do it very well. And we have the best. Here he is, ready for Steven Spielberg's next movie, The Color Gray. <laughs> Would you welcome, please, Dick Shaw.
I'm sorry, it just seemed like the right thing to do. <laughs> This isn't one of the most nauseating evenings I've ever spent. I love show business, God. I can't wait to get into it. I want to congratulate you all for honoring such a wonderful guy. David, you did a usual great job. David Steinberg hosting a Playboy Roast. Incongruous. <laughs> it's like listening to Sister Teresa fart. <laughs> There's something wrong there somewhere. <laughs> but listen, we have to work. What the hell? It's okay. David, congratulations. I can't believe what I'm looking at. <laughs> This is a star, Tommy Chong. A wonderful guy. Congratulations for the honor. All these uh, wonderful uh, stars. I've never seen so many opening acts in my life. But that's okay. Listen, that's okay. That's okay. Well, myself, this is a first almost for me. Never work in front of men, and, excuse me, never work in front of men and women, this kind of language. It shows you how far we've come. 1985 is here, and why not? I am a little upset. I get a little embarrassed doing this kind of humor in front of a mixed crowd. I would appreciate if all the men would leave. <laughs> Look, he's going. <laughs> So this is 1986, right? Equal rights for all, for women, for men, ethnic groups, homosexuals. Gays have a right. For years, they wanted to raise families. Two gays put their sperms together, went to a hospital and says, we demand to have a child. And though they inserted this into a female, nine months later, they had their boy. And they were told, and they flew down to the hospital to look at their child. A hundred kids screaming, crying, and they were so happy to say, which one is our child, to the nurse? The nurse said, that one there, the one that's smiling. And they were so happy, at last, at last, someone laughing is smiling. Look at all the other kids crying, only ours is laughing. And the nurse said, wait, wait a little while. He'll start crying soon, as soon as we take the pacifier out of his ass. <laughs> My kind of crowd. My crowd. One of the disadvantages of coming on this late with this kind of show is that all the good words have been used. There's very little left for someone like myself. Everything has been said tonight, except twat. Nobody uses the word twat anymore. It's too sweet, too gentle. No, twat is something when I was a kid is what you would say, and that would be considered gamey. The first time I heard the word twat, when my father told me about it, I was about 16 years old. He said, son, you're getting ready someday soon, I know. You're getting the feelings to uh, communicate with a female on a sexual level, and obviously you're going to be involved somewhere with a twat. But you don't want to get that woman in trouble. You're a gentleman. Rather than insert yourself into the twat, be a gentleman. Kiss the twat. You can cause no harm. But, he said, sometimes some of the twats may have a, a gamey odor about it. And once you declare yourself beyond the navel, it's very unmanly to go back if the odor is bad. So, 
You keep yourself from being embarrassed. What you do is start out kissing the young lady on the lips and then inserting the center finger in the twat. <laughs> Bring him up to the breast, and as you're kissing the breast, smell the twat. <laughs> And then you will know whether to go further or not. <laughs> now, if you want to find out if she has bad breath, you start out by kissing her twat <laughs> and putting your finger in her mouth. <laughs> Bring it to the breast and then you can kiss her. This does not work in India, where the young ladies sit in sand. <laughs> I don't like James routine to the big laugh. <laughs> Part of my humility. But we're not here just to talk, we're here to honor a guy. A sweet man, a good man, a gentleman. The reason he's that way is because he's been on drugs since the age of two. <laughs> Drugs play an important part in America, not only with him. The new pacifier in America, obviously, is cocaine. The big problem with drugs today is not so much with the children, but the adults, the establishment. Cocaine. Sigmund Freud was the first one to use cocaine, with a college education, that is. Before him, a few jazz musicians, uh, <laughs> some food caterers from Pittsburgh. I'm not talking about bums on cocaine. I'm talking about doctors on cocaine. I'm talking about lawyers on cocaine. I'm talking about brain surgeons on cocaine. I'm talking about baseball players on cocaine. I can understand a, a brain surgeon, but not a baseball player. <laughs> you have to be very brave to stand up there with a bat in your hand, a head full of cocaine, someone throwing a bat at your head 90 miles an hour, a ball, rather. <laughs> and you're looking for the ball. <laughs> you see this white whiff coming toward you, and you hope it hits you in the nostril. <laughs> I don't blame baseball players for taking cocaine. Those games are too long anyway. Five hours a game. On cocaine, it's nine minutes. <laughs> this is a roast. It's part of the times, and I'm happy to be part of it. I have to tell you now that I don't believe, uh, this is, uh, th the only time I do this kind of material, I don't do this in my act, but uh, you, why not? It's part of the times, it's part of the audience, it's part of the evening, and it's fun. But to me, the real humor is in the human condition. The man's insatiable curiosity, this need to collect, this need to assemble, this need for more information. The world, so much information, there's no room left to write it down. So man came up with computers, and then the computers became overloaded, and they came up with supercomputers, then super supercomputers, and they're all breaking down. The logic today comes from the computer. Man's logic means nothing anymore. You want to open up a business? A computer will tell you where to open it up. You want to make a bet? They will call someone, a computer will tell you who to bet on. Computers are taking over the logic of the world. And I don't think it's a bad idea. When you consider how much man's logic has gotten us to the state of the world today, I say, let the machines take over. Now, that, to me, is funny. <laughs> okay, sometimes I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I wanted to express an opinion. But the fact that we are talking as we are now may seem to some people who are overly sensitive uh, in bad taste. But there is no bad taste anymore. The real bad taste is what's happening to the whole world. So this is fun, and there's nothing wrong with it. As Sigmund Freud said, what is it about man who's afraid to admit? Why is it those two most no normal goddamn words, tough? <laughs> Why is it the two most normal, natural, biological functions, going to the bathroom and having sex, have to be done behind the closed doors? What is it about man who's afraid to admit that he's horny and full of shit? <laughs> That's why...
I will turn you over to your host. He fits these categories beautifully. Thank you, David. <laughs> Do the man we have been roasting all evening, the estimable Tommy Chong. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sean. Appreciate it. Told you to wait till after the show to take the pill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These old guys that start. Dope late in life, you know, they're dangerous. You know? <laughs> Divorce their wife and buy a motorcycle. <laughs> Just because they got high once. You know? um, God, that's weird, man. I'm sitting here enjoying the show like you guys all of a sudden. I, it dawned on me, I gotta start thinking about shit to say, you know? Because <laughs> usually we play for a bunch of dopers and you don't matter what you say. You know? <laughs> Pretty safe here, aren't I? <laughs> it's a good mix. Got young people that are stoned on dope. Got old people that are stoned on dope. <laughs> call it, uh, what do they call it? What does old people call drugs? Medicine? Yeah. <laughs> Medication. The old guy there, you better go to the bathroom, man. Yeah. I seen you get up and start to go. He got to the stairs, forgot what he was going for. Pee <laughs> pee. <laughs> Or number two, you can't tell the difference in the latter one. God, it was fun. You know, I was sitting here thinking, you know, God, this is great. All these comedians, you know, talking about me like that, you know. It feels wonderful, you know, I feel important. You know, got Mac and Jamie. <laughs> Good luck, guys. <laughs> Tired being clean comics all week and they come in here to do this shit, isn't it? <laughs> we had nothing else to do but sit around and think of dirty words to say. Oh, Marsha. Marsha Warfield, was she great tonight? Yeah. Woo. That's, well, that's a woman. <laughs> She's the kind that has to kickstart her vibrator, you know? <laughs> and we did make love, Marsha. My ears are still sore, man. <laughs> now, I was married to a black girl. That's why I grew this, you know, for protection. <laughs> Slappy White, man, that's my hero down there. Man. He ain't made it yet, but you know, damn it, he's still trying. <laughs> he ain't gonna give up. And it's a good business being a comedian, you know. I mean, it's, it's, the older you get, the funnier you get, you know, it goes on and on. Look at George Burns, man. Now, you know he ain't had a heart on, you know. <laughs> they have to tell him George is hard. Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, we've got two brains. We got one up here and we got one down here. The one down here is more powerful than the one up here. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, the one up here would be sitting at home enjoying himself, and the one down here would say, Come on, let's go out and get some action, you know? <laughs> yeah, shut up, man. Come on. I'm watching TV, I'm enjoying myself. Come on, man. <laughs> He's in you know, some smoky bar, you know, looking for something, something to stick it in, you know? That's why Cheech is in here tonight, you know? <laughs> That's right. No, he, he, he's home with a bad case of divorce. No, he's, he got divorced, man. Poor guy, man. He'll be okay as soon as his ass grows back. You know? <laughs> Cause he lost it, boy. Ooh. Oh. Uh, they're cruel, man. Everything for the woman, you know. You get it. You know, that's why I don't know. I mean, I I, I know Cheech's problems are problems. You know, it's Dick. Dick made him do it. It wasn't him. You know, what are you gonna do? On the road, you know. So I come. You know what they gotta. You know they're inventing things now. So. I think the perfect invention's gotta be a spare dick. You know, right? So when you go on the road, you just, you know, unscrew it, you know, and say, okay. I'm going on the road, dear. So 
just to make sure, you know, I'm not fooling around. I'm going to leave my dick here with you. <laughs> take care of it. You know, have fun. And when you get, you know, a little horny, you can take my spare dick. I went to a sex shop to buy this thing, man. <laughs> it's weird. Those guys are weird in there. You know, you know what I mean, David. David goes up there. <laughs> David used to work in them. Yeah. Would you like the little or medium or the king size? You know? But, you know, trying to buy a dick, you know, they say, well, do you want to try it out? Oh, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> try to wrap it? <laughs> but I thought, you know, that's great. It's going to look good on television, you know? This would make a nice shot, too, there. <laughs> Some guy just turned on his TV channel and said, what the hell is that show? Yeah, so we got Richard. You know, I love your hair, man. Thank you. Can I see it? <laughs> is it real? Pardon you? <laughs> is, is the hair real? Ask your wife. <laughs> Richard's changed, man. <laughs> I asked to sit next to Dick Sean for this roast, you know, because, you know, I'm getting on in years, you know. Everybody knows that, too. I got a daughter, Ray Dawn Chung, you know, she's kicking ass, doing wonderful. I'm really proud of her, you know. Thank you. But I asked to sit next to Dick, because, you know, I mean, if you want to look young as you're getting old, sit next to an old guy. <laughs> Takes years right off you. Look at that young filly down there. He's good. What haven't I touched on? I don't have a real finish, because uh, I don't need to do this shit. So. David, come on up here for a minute, man. David is, is, is a beautiful man. Uh, I hope his career gets better than, than this. <laughs> you host a wonderful roast. Thank you, Tom. Thank and you the, for including me in this. And uh, I want to thank everybody here, Mac and uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Dick and everybody. Thank you very much, and uh, good night. Thank you all again. Thanks so much.